Okay, folks. So I got to start off by saying that Randy and I have stand, stood here for the past, I don't know, 20 minutes talking about this show and debating some of this. We're talking about input and food specifically today as, as that part of input. And yeah, it, it's such a f infinite, complex, uh, and, and what do you say? I mean, not a painful issue. It's a volatile issue. It's our food. It's our main drug. It hits everybody and it hits everybody in the gut. <laughs> literally. It's a, it's a gut punch. Yeah, literally. Well, so we're going to try to do some justice to that. I mean, Randy sits in here uh, to practice every single day, sitting with so many people who have so many issues and food is not the only answer for all of them, but obviously it's, it's a huge part. And they come in usually with issues. It's, it's, they're overweight. They don't have energy. They got aches and pains. They are fighting illness and disease. What, are, what, am I, what else am I missing? I mean, we've got some guys who are ultra marathon runners who want to better their time as well. And then, as you said, we've got a lot of people who just want to be good stewards of their bodies. So if there's a big gamut and food is not the only part, is it even fair to say maybe it's the biggest part? Maybe it's not. I don't know. It's a big we're, we're laughing at each other because for a long time you have tried to boil it down and say, what are the pillars? what you know just give me the basics and i've always resisted and said gosh it's black and white so just give me the hard. best diet and i'll do it and and so i think the point number one to make today is there is no best diet you know the trick question is kevin what is the best diet <laughs> and, and the only answer is i don't know whichever one works yeah. for me according to my own makeup my own faults dysfunction and and then goals which is sure is good i mean obviously we have goals kind of like we talked about the ultra marathoner and i'm looking at mountain bike races coming up and you're out playing ultimate frisbee and stuff and we have certain goals that other people may not have i don't think anybody would say that they don't care about more energy more clarity more creativity more critical thinking everybody wants that and, and that's probably when we break it down we look at the patients in the clinic that's probably the majority isn't it or aches and pains uh, well, I think nowadays in the clinic, the majority is going to be a significant diagnosis, <clears throat> autoimmune disease, uh, cardiometabolic disease. And that's, that's a significant amount of pain that is enough for them to come and say, Hey, I want to approach this differently. Yeah. So it is a little bit different, uh, to the average person where maybe there, there's not a diagnosis, but there's everybody isn't as well as they could be. And one of the reasons is always going to be none of us have eaten perfectly for our right. situation, our goals, our body types, our genetics. And, and we live in a country that is, and we live in a culture that is so incredibly confused on the vast array of choices and possibilities. And even in the healthy world, there's a paleo style, a Mediterranean style, a keto style, a, a vegetarian style, a, a vegan style. And, and, and to, to think you can boil it down and say, Kevin, you should be a vegan. <clears throat> It's just not fair. It, and, and, and I think people are now frustrated with that and still in the midst of their brain fog and their fatigue and their energy and, you know, or, or dermatitis or acne or, or whatever is going on. Is yeah. your food related to that? And the answer is yes. Okay. Well, and, and I did really want to start off, folks, with I mean, talking about food is I don't think it's a, an exciting thing for anyone. I mean, at the end of the day, we all want, as we sit here sipping our Starbucks coffee drug, we all want to eat what tastes good. I mean, I do. At the end of the day, I mean, obviously I've grown to love a good salmon and some good asparagus and good Brussels sprouts, but I'd also love to have a huge pizza pie. I'd love to have a seafood enchilada with as much greasy, cheesy stuff on it as possible. Uh, I mean, I, I would rather just eat what tastes good. Who wouldn't? Who, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? And that's what our, I mean, you watch TV, that's what it's full of. Every commercial, every ad is, is food that makes you feel good. Is related to that. Yeah. Let me ask you another trick, trick question. What is the number one determining factor of what people eat? Gosh, I would right off the bat say taste. You, uh -huh. you would. You would right off the bat say taste. But number one, convenience. Uh, okay. And I'll go to you too. If after a meal you're completely full, but there's a little bit of that greasy enchilada left over right in front of you, you are not hungry. It, but it's so convenient, mm -hmm. you will eat it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you got to clean your plate because <laughs> people are starving and, and it helps them if you overeat. And, and, right. That's right. And hence, we also have food that you can get through a window and food that you can buy right there next to your gas. Well, okay. Okay. Now I got to call you out though because <laughs> Michael Pollan would say if it came through the window, it's not actually food. I, 
I, well, it, it might even be a little bit of food, yeah. but what Trump said is it's very convenient. Yeah, very convenient. 20% of all meals are eaten in the car. Really? Most women will make their car buying decision based on the placement of cup holders. That's ridiculous. That's, no. that's from Michael Pollan. That, that's, wow. And car manufacturers, know, they know this now. So well, We should make a call at Michael Pollan. So we are, we are fans. The guy has done so many things. The book he has, he has a little book. I wish I had it here in front of me uh, called Food Rules. It's a 30-minute read at most. It is funny. And it is poignant and it is profound. And we've given it out to patients for four years now. Uh, it's it's a, one, one chapter per page. He makes a sometimes one sentence chapter and just yeah. makes a point. If and your grandma can't pronounce the ingredients, it's, it's not, not food. food. <laughs> yeah. So there's a great resource. I, I'd encourage if, if, all, if all you got out of this show is go get that book and read it. Uh, it is, it changes the vernacular for the patients who are in here. It, uh, the book is actually a distillation of, of one of his other books called In Defense of Food. Which is a big book. That's if you, well, that's if you really want to get into it. Uh, well, I, it it's not too bad. I mean, no. it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a primer. Uh, it's a good, you know, food rules is, is, again, simple statements. In Defense of Food, in, in the famous subtitle, Eat Food, Mostly Plants. Not too much. Not too much. Okay. I want to, uh, so then I, I want to umbrella this whole talk right now with one of your, I say, I think your uh, functional medicine famous line on, as you're looking at somebody talking about food, what are you putting in your body? You finish my statement that it doesn't want. Oh, uh, right. Give your body what it wants and don't put in your body what it doesn't like. But that. Yeah. And that is, I mean, since the day that you told me that, the thought of that, of my body is, I, I am feeding myself. So today, whatever I put in my mouth is I'm feeding my body, the building blocks, the regeneration of cells. And so I'm putting things in that possible, some things in that my body does not want. Uh, and, and that may be different than you. You're fine with corn. I'm not. I, for whatever reason, I have an interest. So my body does not want corn. Yours is okay with it. So it's personalized. And what am I not putting in my body that it needs? Do I need fish oil? Do I need potassium, magnesium? Do I need more of this food, less of this? That's what we're talking about. And that is personal, but that's such a huge thing to think about that we, today we start off in the morning, we're going to end up at the night and we're going to feel this way or that way. And in the coming weeks, months, years, whatever. And what are we putting in that our body does not want? And we're masking it. We're giving it a heartburn medicine even uh, to, because it really doesn't want that. Well, and it, uh... That's right. So I would also start off because like we said before the show, it's a slippery slope. This can mm -hmm. quickly get into what we call food Phariseeism Nazism, or food Nazism. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden it's about the food rules that, right. oh my gosh, what a, what a horrible person you are for eating that kind of food. And, and, and you can't go there. But then on the flip side, we live in a culture that says, ah, if you're not dying of of, of a heart attack and 300 pounds overweight, then, you know, I'm not as bad as the next guy. And we justify the donuts. And, and if the, the FDA approves that a packing peanut must be safe, you, you can eat it. And, <laughs> and there we go. And, and so, I, you know, I don't think anybody's going to be here in the show that does not have some knowledge, I think, of you know, what they think of as healthy foods and not healthy foods. Uh, doing it, obviously, is the bigger thing. So as we talk about, and we can sit here and talk about the best foods, the worst foods, whatever. Obviously, the issue is, what will you do? It's kind of like you with exercise. You know, what's the best exercise? The one you'll do. Okay, same here. What, um, dietarily wise, I mean, if you come in here, because we had people do that uh, here in the practice. I'll never forget the one couple who the church tried to get to come see us. And, and they said, I'm not going to go see Dr. James. He'll let me throw out everything in my pantry that I like. And that's a terrible perspective. I mean, that's, it's not. It's oversimplified. Well, it it's, is because the point is not to be a monk and to never, you know, to abstain from everything good in life at all. I mean, we, again, we're sitting here drinking our. If, if, Coffee drug. if we boil it down, because you and I are always trying to give people what's the boil down. And, and I think the boil down cannot be a concrete, immovable fact. It has to be a principle. Mm -hmm. And so how do I personally, because you can't overlay this on somebody else, how do I eat, live, think, breathe in order to be becoming uh -huh. the kind of person that I want to become? That is perfect. Yeah. Every second of every day i'm breathing a certain kind of air i am and my body has to respond to that if i if you live in a downtown polluted kind of a place then this is a tremendous pressure on your body we live in nearly perfect air probably uh but on on the food side that's going to be your most intimate connection with the 
good of the world around you. It'll sustain you, but it's also you're putting in some things that your body is going to have to deal with every second in every cell, uh, the cellular respiration where you have input, the cell has to do what it does and there's output or waste. And the efficiency of that is we all take for granted until it doesn't work. And then we say, oh my gosh, my knees hurt. Oh my gosh, I've got a headache. Oh my gosh, I've got dermatitis or I've got brain fog or I'm too tired. Somewhere in the, in the space of I didn't notice that yesterday or 10 years ago and now I notice this symptom, your nutrition has an impact on that without a doubt. And so then the response is, okay, what are you going to put in that your body needs that you're not putting in? And what are you going to leave off that your body's kind of like saying, gosh, I don't need more of that. Or, or it's actually poisonous to the body. And, and the body has to detoxify, costing you even more energy. And then the hard part is you've got to do this all day long, every day. That's the challenge. And then we come back to the rest of life and convenience and taste, which if I had to choose, that's what I would rather do is do what's convenient and do what tastes good. And yet it does give me the results. I, I really love the book undoctored, which was, I've got it written down here, Dr. William Davis. And this line that he says where he's talking to somebody about food at some point, you know, they'll come and go, okay, so you want me to be one of those extreme eaters and eat extreme. He says, no, I'm trying to help you understand that the way that we eat, especially in America, Western culture, the way we eat now, that's extreme. The, re, the way that we eat the same foods every day all year long because we don't cycle foods anymore that's extreme that we eat processed foods that we eat high sugar that we eat you know high gluten right. that's a part of everything i mean you talk about that so often with patients who you've talked to about you know gluten as a as an issue and you say so are you are you not eating gluten well no only a couple pieces of bread a day now and that's not eating gluten free and but again it's so countercultural the first time somebody told me that about bread i was like you kidding me this is bread. This is biblical. This is, this is right. This is the Jesus even is the bread of life. Jesus, yeah. I mean, it's the fishes and the loaves. It's bread, uh, you know. Which I had to learn. Granted, that's not the same bread. It's a, it's a different bread, and and kind of on a funny note, I would I would be willing to bet that Jesus had a different microbiome in his gut that was processing this bread. Yeah. And we can you can dig into the biochemistry of that way down deep. Um, but the extremism of what we're doing today, if we pick on gluten, because so many people yeah. will say, well, that's just a fad. And it's not. It, but we're, we're not going to say that God messed up when he made wheat. Because it feels nonsensical. It, it, I'm it reading feels the Old, old Testament and it, and it feels, it, yeah. That, that, that's right. And, and many people say that, like they roll their eyeballs and go, like, okay, come on. That just feels like the, the latest craze of, of whatever. And I would say, let, let's not vilify a plant. Uh, but what, what has happened in, there's so many subsets of areas underneath there. We have dramatically changed the way that we plant or the, even the seeds, the seeds are different than they were four or five generations ago. And so the, the plant itself has changed. And then we talk about the pesticides and the glyphosate and all of those inputs into the plant, modified. genetically modified stuff. And then we talk about uh, the human microbiome as a part of that digestion process, and that is also vastly different. And then we talk about even the changing genetic or the, the genes of the microbiome and also the genes of ourselves, also drifting, if you will, into a different state. Well, now you put this piece of wheat, gluten, or gliadin, or whatever the protein is into the system, and there's a, an immunological trigger. And so the, the, the problem isn't wheat per se or gluten per se or, or dairy, gluten, corn, soy, all the famous foods that are problematic. It is that in our industrialized food processing system, which is also based on convenience, right. we have created a, a food system that is more hostile to our own physiology. Like Franken foods. Yes. And our bodies themselves have become less able to handle differentness and there's a response and that response is going to be driven by the immune system so that less less able to handle differentness I, so i wanted to hit on that because we're at that point where everybody here listening uh possibly or their children if they have kids are encountering these food insensitivities food intolerances food allergies 
And I think back, you know, when we were kids, I never heard of that thing. You know, was my, my, I can remember one kid, I think he had some kind of a diabetic thing. You know, you have to have an extra chocolate milk at lunch or whatever. It was. That's, I, don't, I don't remember nothing. And now it feels again like a fat, like, come on, give me a break. Well, no, <clears throat> excuse me. And we can even go into statistics there and say, in general, if we go to our parents, they would say in, in a relatively big school, like a high school of a thousand people, let's say that there might be one or two or three or four kids with a diagnosis, asthma, right. severe allergies, a, a GI thing or a, a peanut sensitivity. And then when you and I were growing up, maybe a little bit more. And, and, and right now we're looking out the window at, at our local elementary school. And if we go over there, 30% of those kids will have a diagnosis wow. of al asthma, allergy, ADD, ADHD, autism, right on down the line. That cannot be driven by only foods, but the, the nutritional state of the industrial food processing system, the way it processes in our own guts, our own microbiomes, is all coming together to create this situation, which is producing more and more unwellness. Well, can, and so can we say that and, and meet why it's because it seems so frustrating, it seems so complex, it seems so convoluted, and the answer is it, it is, and it's getting more so, and that's not a that's not a that's not a hopeful statement. That's feels it's, pessimistic it's, and negative. It's daunting. It, it's it's really challenging it, for for people to hear that. So, oh my gosh, what do we eat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the fact that if we had done one of those food allergy stuff, people have probably seen them online where you got the all little pen pricks or you know needle pricks on the back, the, the allergy test. And if we had done that with uh, the group of kids in our class in second grade way back when, that there wouldn't be so many so much reactivity. So much re and today, and you see There's people more they're reactivity. reacting to happen. So that's just the world that we live. So, you know, to some point what do we do, which is the complexity. Now we as you know, we ultimately are saying that to eat today in a way that fuels our body to be at the best that we can be is, I don't know, 50% harder than it was back then. And there's just a reality. There's okay. the reality, which is why we're doing the show. And you right. and I have talked about what is going to be our number one pillar today. And it's basically going to be to increase awareness, to simply start thinking about this, to be aware there, there's going to be a time and a place where you and I, at some point in the future, might stop at a McDonald's, but that would be a catastrophic something or other that is driving us down that pathway because we are I'm so aware. Of starvation we are in the middle of the desert. <laughs> and that's there happens to be a McDonald's. We might consider <laughs> getting a cup of coffee. And, that, and, and so right there, I mean, because you get into, like you talked about the slippery slope of, of being a food Nazi or self, being self-righteous, which it comes off. I mean, I've, I've, I've had my kids get irritated at dad's food Nazism. And of course, I just want them to be well, uh, and, and it is, it goes back to your goals. What are your goals? And we have people, by the time they come to the practice, they're at their wits end because now they just have something that's debilitating them. And the most common one is not a huge diagnosis. It's the mom. She's 45. She's got kids. She's been pouring out like mad. And now she's just at the end of the rope. She has low energy. She's sleeping 14 hours and not feeling rested. And she, all of a sudden it's, it's like the heart attack. It's, this is not going to go well. The, the wheels are, are, right, are, off. are coming off and, yeah. and the instability is there. And, and more common than sleeping 14 hours is she just can't sleep. She's exhausted and now insomnia is creeping in and I can't fall asleep. I can't stay asleep. My mind is racing. Um, and, and, and we're not going to look at her and say, oh, you've been eating at McDonald's, haven't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, a, again, a combination of out of convenience right. sake, and I just got to get the kids to school. And, and what am I going to feed these three kids for breakfast in the morning? That's, and, and of course, we all lean on cereal. And you and I grew up with cereal. Yeah. And we're amazed that we're as well as we are today with that history. But now the awareness is increasing to say, okay, now wait a minute. There's other ways. There's other things that you can buy. And, and what are your goals? What are your hopes? And, and that's what we do in the clinic is, is help people just – think through even the finances of that. It's not more expensive if you look at it as price per nutrient, but price per full belly will definitely change. Right. Uh, you and I didn't talk about that before the show, well, but I think finances well, well, is a we'll big... talk about it. I, I, do, I did want to say, I mean, if we're looking for, like you talked about a takeaway, that if there's a paradigm shift of food, and I'm going to speak to America. I know this podcast will be heard in other places uh, than America, 
but especially in America, food, as you said, convenience, I, I said taste, and you said it's really convenience rules, but we are led by that, by what tastes good, what's easy to get to. And we, we look at food as fuel and fun. I mean, it's yeah. fuel. If you look at the Super Bowl, man, it is fuel to, you know, fuel up those football players. And it's fun to, when they have the Doritos commercial and whatever tastes good while you're watching the game and stuff. And to take that and say food is historically. So go back to what he said, Dr. Davis, about food, how we eat now is extreme. That historically, we're in this small span of time where we eat the way we do. Historically, before that, we ate for food was medicine. If you had an illness, you looked at the food and you treated it with food. And we still have some cultures who do that well. Food is medicine. It is not just fun. It is not just for fuel. You and I now live that lifestyle, but it is, it's a big paradigm shift. You have to pay attention. I hear you all the time talking to Marcy, uh, Randy's wife, on the phone about the food list. Okay, where are you getting the grocery? What's tonight's meal? And you're making enough so that there's leftovers so the kids can take it to school. You can bring yours to work. And you and I sit out on the deck every day at the office and have our leftovers of whatever, quinoa I, and salmon and veggies. And I, I think that's a, that's a good point to make because that food conversation that we have once a week is a tough conversation. Mm -hmm. It's it, a pain in the it's, butt. It's, a, it's painful. And, and uh, for a couple to say, but for us, it's, it's important enough. We say, look, we're going to go through the pain of having this conversation uh, because of our goals and, and what we need to do. Um, you were mentioning the past, and, and I, I would say historically, I don't know that it's fair to always say that food was medicine because if you go into deep history, food was basically staying alive. Right, we, that's and, true. And there were some times it, when the, you know, people were dying at 45 it, and they weren't doing uh, well. That, that is right, too. When we, I do think there's a lot of confusion, especially in the paleo world, where people talk about this, this grand history of the way food was and, and how rough and tough life was, and people were barely staying alive. And I, I, it's, it's hard to come down to pillars there. But suffice it to say, along with Dr. Davis, food was necessary. There was also fun food. Every, but the celebrations back then were things about birth, marriage, death, and feasts and festivals, you know, five, six, seven times a year. Right. And now, and, and, and you and I say, do hey, your, you, do your you have time. cake and ice cream on your birthday, but we have now grown into a culture where we have cake and ice cream every morning and we call it Fruit Loops or pancakes or bagel even, and cream cheese. Yeah, toast. Yeah. Bagel and cream cheese with a cup of coffee in the car on the way to cup work, coffee, all stressed out. Uh, sugary, high caloric. Yeah. With cream that's not even cream. And and people are like, oh, yeah, I get it. I need to change that. But something has to click for people to increase their awareness and say, yes. And, and then you, you, you'd you make a change and you switch from coffee mate to real cream or whatever. Is, These, is this, I was going to say, is this fair to say? I mean, let's, again, let's, let's pick on the patients here that they come in and they have an issue that's driven them to spend a lot of time and a lot of money and to make a lifestyle change. And that they now become the weirdos out there in a yeah. sense, food wise. So we all, now again, weirdos only in regards in, to the to our current culture, our current uh, faulty extreme side. So we're going, you know, it's a, we call it back to the basics. I know that's what paleo talks about, but we're going back to, well, this is Michael Pollan's food rule, real food. Uh, what's mostly uh, eat food, mostly plants and not too not much, too much. Yeah. And, and of course the definition of what is food. If you look at the back of, of a Doritos, can you really call that food with those ingredients back there? And the it only one you really know what it is is maybe corn. Something that you and, can ingest that won't kill you. And it's something you can ingest. It'll fill your belly. It'll make it, it certainly taste good on the tongue. And can all I of those tell my Doritos things. story? Because you were in it. I don't even know if you know this. I don't think I know that. We one. went to an event that I won't name uh, that had about 400 guys at the event. They had, it was like Frito pot, you know, chili and stuff, whatever. But they had... Uh, I don't know if it was actually Doritos, but they had a, a corn chip with cheese on it or whatever. So 400 guys ate plenty for lunch back into the, you know, the auditorium. the auditorium. And for the next two hours, I sat around in a cloud of burps. <laughs> it was, and smells. It was Dorito burps and the smell. And I thought, I'm never going to eat a Dorito in my life. But what it told me is that, that those are not digesting well. I mean, corporately here, these are not digesting well. These are coming back up. If they had all eaten uh, a salad, I don't think this would be happening. And again, it's not to vilify Doritos. And to go back to what you said, the cake and ice cream, I'll never forget you saying that too, that when you are, you know, you're not doing that because it's, you don't need cake and ice cream for every meal, but you do it once a month or once a quarter for the birthday, the 
the, the celebration, the celebration, it's righteous. And you, in that context, uh, it, I love that. you're going to enjoy it more. So here, here's a, uh, a famous question is, you know how you do word associations mm -hmm. and you would say a word. And so the word is chocolate cake. What's the first word in your mind? Ice cream. So the average first word in the American mind versus the average word association in the French mind. So you know what most Americans say when we say chocolate cake? Guilt. Oh, really? And what's the first word association in the French people's mind? Like, celebration. Celebrate. Wow. And that reflects because Americans are in this culture where we have chocolate cake so much. It's so easy. It's easy to come by. It's, it's there all the time. And it's not for birthdays. It's for like, you know, somebody just brought some cake by the office or whatever. And for the French, it is, it's love and celebration at celebratory times. Gosh, and you know what you brought me to also is just, again, that extreme way we live in America where food is everywhere. And so the chocolate cake for a lot of people, let's say I'll, I'll pick on guys. It's the payday bar or the, uh, whatever convenience guy food that's at the hardware store. Why on earth is there food at the hardware store? You're surrounded by fast food places and restaurants already. The grocery store is right there, but you can't find a place anymore where there's not that drug of, of a, basically a high sugar, generally at high the, sugar uh, or high salt at the checkout aisle at the yeah. checkout aisle. And I'm there and I'm getting my lumber or my whatever for whatever project and the payday bar. <laughs> it looks great. And then I'm, I'm with you on the cake and guilt. I mean, that's, I don't need that's not good for me, but and, you know, the kids aren't here. My wife, you know, who hounds me about food, she's not here. I'm having, a, I'm having two payday bars <laughs> and then I'm going to feel guilty about it. And I'm going to be burping it and, you know, having the, the ramifications, but that is, that is something that we are fighting today. Again, go, like going back that did not used to be. So yes, the fight is greater. The battle. And it, right. And it will always now be there because yeah. in the next 20, you know, in the next generation, we're not going to go backwards in the availability of easy food, easy calories that are there all the time. And, and I joke with patients all, all the time that, you know, to, to not have a snack is an intellectual, uh, tough decision. Mm -hmm. But the opposite of that, we live in a culture where food literally jumps in your mouth. I mean, it, you, you walk out the checkout aisle at the lumber yard and you're like, how did this food get in my mouth? I don't, I don't even remember buying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, dude, I'll never forget my dad, Dan Miller, which a lot of people know. He's got the podcast 48 Days and he was doing a sugar fast. And he was telling my sister, this was decades ago, telling her about it as he was eating a Snickers bar. <laughs> and she's like, dad. And he looked down in total amazement. I mean, it was just, yeah, yeah habit. He just picked up. And you and I have done that when you're fasting, especially if we're, if we're cooking meal. Right. And, and you, you spit it out of your mouth. Yeah. And you're like, I mean, you're just tasted just like normal. I have a bite. It's part of the fun of cooking. And then, ah. Yeah, and you're shocked. We're so, that hand to mouth is. That, well, I was just getting ready to bring up smokers. This is a very famous story with smokers because, and, and now we all kind of know that sugar is as addictive as the tobacco, but smokers would oftentimes say, yeah, I was quitting and I went in to, to get some gas and I paid for my gas and I did not even remember yeah. buying a pack. And all of a sudden it's there in my chest pocket again and I don't remember buying it. So, and so then you go into the actor. I mean, there's obviously a doctor's office. It probably exists there, but so many offices these days and there is candy on the counter, there's a bowl of M and M's. There's a you go to church. You go to almost anywhere around every corner in a hospital is a fresh pot of coffee. It's I was in the <laughs> wine store the other day with one of my one of my daughters. She's ten. They and gave course, her a sucker. They, the guy said, "Hey, we got suckers over here." And and I and then I feel like a jerk to go. No thanks. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? What kind of father are We're you? We're calling social <laughs> services on you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you feel terrible. They they do it at the bank uh, drive through. And they'll put a sucker to see a kid when in there. the kids get a haircut. Yeah, it's doggy <laughs> treat for the dog and a sucker for the kids. And yeah, you're right. It does. It just. It How jumps. come they don't offer a bowl of broccoli? I don't know. Well, I'm thinking of a glass of wine or something. <laughs> come on, if you're going to offer some coffee, you know, you know, it makes me think of this. Um, so you know, I, I we had our, our times of being uh, you know really involved in athletics, and today we think about that like the pro athlete is going to put all this effort towards what he eats or even the actor, you know, the Hugh Jackman who's getting ready to play Wolverine in the next X-Men or whatever. And it's headlines about his diet and how he gets up in the morning and eats all these extra foods and he's exercising and yada, yada. And we, 
understand that for a celebrity, for an athlete who needs to what? Be at their best. And you think, why do we not do that? Why am I not a pro? I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a worker, an employer. Why am I less than them in my performance? I, I should be. I mean, I have to knock on my head to get out of the norm and, and say, why am I not acting like a pro athlete? Why wouldn't I do that? It, it, that goes back to what I kind of call the stewardship of we've been given this incredibly complex piece of machinery mm -hmm. that is the most complex piece of quote unquote machinery in the universe that we know about. Literally, if we talk about the brain and all the complexities of the physiology there and to think, to even imagine that you could go to work in, in, a, in a job where we're really thinking hard. And, and probably one of the most challenging things in, in the human endeavor is interpersonal relationships. Well, that's all of us. That's you being a father, husband, wife. Uh, and <laughs> depends on the day. <laughs> depends on the day if you're going to be a wife today. But, uh, and to think that you could fuel that with a quick bowl of Fruit Loops in the morning. Oh, my gosh. It, yeah. it just, it, we do ourselves a disservice. And again, there's going to be the emergency time that says, but honestly, on the emergency, on the emergency time, I would say, just don't eat. Just take that as an opportunity to fast, give your body that signal. But I'm sure many people are thinking out there and saying, oh my gosh, that just, and if, by the way, if people don't eat their breakfast or their lunch, and then at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, they're hitting that yeah. shaky, jittery, uh, oh my gosh, I got to get something to eat. That is not a fast metabolism. That is pathology, as I like to say. That is not normal. You are not blessed with a fast metabolism and you need to get something to eat. Flip it around. You are basically so unwell that you are not resilient enough to make it a few hours without a meal. And that is probably most people in America, that's a red flag. Well, I was going to say, now going back to not to make the paleo diet a focus, but in that arena, the hunters and gatherers and stuff there, they were perfectly fine with a day without food. I mean, it's, it happened all the time and their body was that efficient. That, that's right. Now, to be fair, they did not like that. Oh, I don't need. <laughs> okay. Okay. We right. Should. So they, yeah. so society went along and said, man, if we can get wealthy enough, if we can to get efficient enough to, to never that. have to go hungry again. So probably after the great depressions, that was the last time there was people in America who were consistently hungry, barring poverty in certain situations like that. Uh, but culturally, now we've flipped around. We're now in the third or fourth generation of never missing a meal. Yeah. But the problem is if the meal is Fruit Loops or, uh, you know, the dollar menu at McDonald's, you are starving of nutrients, even though your belly is full. And now Over, we've got overfed and undernourished. undernourished. That's right. And all of the implications of that, back to your athletic thing, to think that I, I am a professional. I, yes. And I really am. Not only that, I want to be a really good hey, husband. You're actually a doctor. I, I, you I, can actually claim. I, I have to make that up. <laughs> you're really a professional. I, yeah, rub it in. Rub it in. That's right. Kevin. I don't know exactly what you do. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> but you're really good at it. And, and it. and it requires a lot of brain energy and effort. And you can't, you can't support that on, on a bowl of Fruit Loops. It's just you yeah. You could, and of course, every many people do, but you it's, are breaking. There, well, there's going to be there's a going payoff. To be a going to be a consequence. That's and to right. everybody who says, because I, I do get frustrated when you have the person who says, ah, you know, my grandpa was a farmer and he ate nothing but you know rawhide and nails and lived to be and smoked ten packs a day and lived to be ninety. His body's amazing at survival. God bless him for having some good genetic, you know, makeup. He probably did some other things that helped to his health and wellness, but maybe how much better he could have been, That's right. how much better quality, even if he didn't live longer. Yeah. Sometimes we put the length of life and I love your aspect of, uh, you told me years ago with the elk that go through my property and, and Randy says, Hey, do you, uh, you ever see an elk hobbling behind the herd there with his oxygen tank and his walker? And you know, funny, funny. No, of course. No, they're going strong until the day their time's up. And then boom, that's what I want to do as opposed to getting to that point and then lingering is your word that is just the most detestable word to me lingering, which is what we are now saying is the norm as well, man. When you hit, you know, 50, 60, 70, there's going to be some cognitive decline. And at some point you're going to slide into that nursing home and linger for however long while your kids take care of you. And we have a bazillion dollar industry there now on something that should ought not happen. Ought not happen.
Yeah, and the, I don't want to be that guy on my burden in my family. Well, the flip side of lingering is so many people today, I think, in, in our generation and older, think, well, you got to die of something, right? So they're going to justify their easy, convenient breakfast and say, it's not like I'm smoking. It's not like I'm carousing. It's not like I'm doing, you know, all this other bad stuff. I, you got to die of something. And I would say, well, no, the question in your mind is, what are you going to linger with? Yeah. And that, yeah, that, that's that is motivating. That's what convicts me yeah. the most. Am I going to hit this certain age and now my family is going to take care of me and most of my finances are going to go towards this care? Or am I going to be the able body? I posted a thing on Facebook of this 91 year old guy running a, a race. It was a sprint hundred meters. It wasn't only that he ran it. It's that he, he ran it like you and I would as far as his form and his physique. It was unreal. He it looked was, like a, a, anybody running. He didn't look like an old man hobbling. There were other people on the line, but not this dude. You think, how did he get to that? And everybody would look at that and go, well, that's just an anomaly. And of course, when you then find out about people like that, no, they had specific, it wasn't all food. They probably had joy in his life and purpose in his life and right. things that we're going to get to in this show as time goes on as well. But what is the goal? I mean, that's, what, that's what, what's the who, goal and the motivation. What kind of person do you want to be becoming? Be becoming is your, yeah. And right now at 51, I'm thinking about 52, but I'm also thinking about 72, 82, 92. Yeah. You also did that, that post where you, you've got a picture of two women who are both about 75. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One in the nursing home, staring out the window with a blanket on, and the other one was in the gym doing some curls. Well, the, the, the convict, there's multiples like that. The one that convicts me the most is the one, and it was this outspoken, natural, vegan, you know, <laughs> advocate, and she was, yeah, like 70 or something like that, and looked like, like 90, and then the over. other one was some celebrity who's known as like the chocolate lady, mm -hmm. talk about chocolate yeah, cake, yeah. and she looked like she was 50 at most, looked like a million bucks, and you look at other things beyond food, maybe there is joy. And the celebration of chocolate, rather than the fear of it. How do you be That's, becoming the kind of person who can rightfully enjoy chocolate in such a way that, that you're doing justice to it? And yeah. it, it, it probably isn't going to be a Snickers every day. Yeah. It probably is going to be in the context of all your other food is, is excellent. You, you've got fasting days in there. You've got mission and passion and purpose in your life. You go to bed on time. And you know what? You also have really high quality. You and I like to be chocolate snobs. Yeah. And I'm going to, I would like to, save money by not buying Fruit Loops and Snickers over here and, and have a really awesome, you know, $10, $20 bar of chocolate less often. Gosh, it makes me think of like, the, like you saying birthday cake for everything. It'd be like vacation. How much do we look forward to the big vacation? Do we want to be there? I mean, I know at first everybody say, yeah, vacation yeah, the beach all day. the time. I, it would be terrible. <laughs> it's like you at the beach and after a couple of hours, you're like, I've done all the nothing okay. I know how to do. Uh, <laughs> granted, there's time for Sabbath and then we'll get into those things too. But we don't want that all the time. It would take away. It would uh, reduce the, the value of those few hours on the beach of the special. I, I want purpose. I want challenge. Mm -hmm. To some degree, I even want hardship. And then I want the recovery and the celebration. It's kind of like good pain. Almost. That's a good line, right? <laughs> That's a good, we'll have to stick with that. Hmm. I, you know, you know, in this, I know people are, I mean, I am, I, I, I want prescriptive, tell me what to do. We haven't done that in this. Like you said, this is about awareness that we are in a culture, we are in a norm that is causing problems. It shouldn't be. And if you want something different, you are going to have to be different. That's not good news uh, for the most part. It's, it's, it's hard. I would say, you know what? I would say, especially with food, there is more baggage with food. I mean, you literally, in being the weirdo who doesn't eat that and eats this, you get social backlash from your friends, from your family, maybe from your spouse, from your kids. It, it, you will also get it from your own body. There true. will be withdrawal. A caffeine headache is an example of that, or a sugar headache. And we also have to talk about people having, you mentioned baggage, and there really is emotional connection to food oh my gosh. And, and food comfort and the addictions and it, it is it's a, all of us it is a drug i mean we're in this time right now where we we all know you know cocaine meth alcohol whatever now we have marijuana uh that's the big news out there and yet we know and it sounds exaggerated and sounds over the top but it's just the facts and you know you are a doctor you know this it comes out in your medical journals and stuff that the th what's killing more people in sugar gluten I mean, number food. one drug and yeah. it's the number one drug that nobody has if i'm if i come to a meeting with you 
and I'm smoking a joint or snorting some Coke or knocking back uh, five tequilas, everybody's going to look at me weird, but I can sit there and eat anything that I want at any weight level that I may be at coughing and hacking, whatever. And there is no negative social perspective on that. And, and again, here's a slippery soap because we don't want to sit there and, and judge, but my gosh, the fact that you're almost vilified, if you are the if guy you who, the Oh, snack. you pick a salad. Oh, yeah. you're the healthy person <laughs> or worse yet. You don't eat that. I mean, we have people sometimes, you know, they'll bring food to the office and we may or may not eat it. We may just eat our leftovers. That doesn't feel good. I mean, I, I don't do that with pride so much. I, I almost feel bad a lot of times. So talk about the elephant in the room. I, I, for some people mm. outside of just battling your own appetite, your own taste buds, your own desires, you're battling a culture, culture who I, I, the stigma is huge. Right. So we, we use the word weirdo, you know, you're a food yeah. weirdo, but really you're, you're, you're swimming upstream. The culture is, is a torrent of this downstream, the food, it just jumps in your mouth, that kind of an idea. And to step outside of that and start to swim upstream, it does take mission and passion and purpose and yeah. having a goal. And, and, and like we've come back around on today, it takes, first of all, it takes awareness. You've got to see that your culture is pulling you down that pathway. And in order to step out of that, and then yeah. it's going to be individualized and personalized as to, well, why would you do that? It isn't to be a more moral person. It, there's, there's no rightness or wrongness and everybody's got their own individual story and people would say, well, you don't understand, you know, I, I came out of this, this, this trauma when I was a child and food was this. And I would say, I do understand we're all on this spectrum of food addiction. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not putting anybody in, in one box or the other. And I, I am a food it, addict. I'll raise my hand. Food addict we are. And, and, and so even if we use that AA kind of mantra to say, well, number the first step is to recognize yeah. I am this person. Number two is to recognize there is, I have lost control. Uh -huh. I, I can't control my culture. And to some degree, I can't control my own appetites. And then, and then it's fair to say right now, but how do I control a part of that to be becoming the kind of person who has a different appetite as the days go by, you can lean into that. And to give more grace to it, if you look at those, we talk about drugs, all those other things that we would talk about that we think of as legit, you know, those are really drugs. We can abstain from those. We can't abstain forever from food. It's something that we still have to do. It'd be like the alcoholic, but every day he still needs a, a thimbleful at least. Uh, right. Not this is yet. the one that we have to do. So it's abstaining from the foods that are harming us and going towards the foods that are helping us. You know, one thing on that though, that I will attest to that we've experienced personally and that you've seen with a zillion uh, patients and, and whatnot. Um, I listened to a Zig Ziglar message that he talked about he had gotten to a point in his life where he was overweight 202 pounds and so he started running and then he ran a block and the next day he ran a block and a mailbox they call that block and a mail bam it's a bam program block and a mailbox every day another mailbox and he got to where he was running four miles and he you know started off and he could do a few push-ups and then he got to where he could do the military push-ups you know do it and clap and whatever totally changed his life he says it wasn't but running he says he detested it it was nine months nine months after his running that uh, beginning to, or continuing to run that he realized I'm enjoying this. I'm, I'm actually, I, this is a beautiful day and this is a, I'm having a beautiful moment. And he realized I'm enjoying this run nine months later. How much later is it going to take to start eating in a different way before you realize that I feel great. This is worth it. Well, I, <clears throat> it, and I'm working with patients, mm -hmm. so Zig did that on his own. But people are coming to me, and one of the first things that I will tell them is don't have that expectation. Of liking it? That's right. Yeah. Of It is irrational to think that one day you're going to wake up out of bed and spring out of bed, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, full of energy. That's that's not going to happen. But what can happen is that you're going to, that, that realization for Zig was slow. Yeah. He, it, it was not a sudden thing. And so in, in the same way of nobody goes to high school as a freshman expecting to wake up a month later with a graduation. Mm -hmm. you, it's a, it's a process going through time and even high school, we all know it's a four year process. 
But if we said something else about, hey, I want to get stronger, I want to do push-ups, you don't go and do three or four and expect to have a bigger bicep. Yeah. It takes time, daily consistency. And we all know about muscle strength and going to school, but what we can't see is metabolism. Mm -hmm. That's what we can't see. And especially when you start to talk about energy, mood, um, my, my resilience, my wherewithal, just the, my mojo that I want to get out of bed and go to work. Why, why can't I have that desire? And, and I would say you can aim towards it, but as it gets there, you're never going to wake up one day and say, oh my gosh, I have so much energy. You will simply be going to work and doing what you do. And, and I, I do think you get more sensitive. And when we have experience, you get, I am now to the point to where if I don't feel at my normal, you know, good level, I, it's a big deal. And my, I'm not okay with feeling. You're sensing the negative. Yeah, I'm sensing yeah. the negative. And that, now I don't want that. And so, again, you know, we're going to motive, which is everything. I mean, we're talking, you know, we're talking about you know, health and wellness and nutrition. This is personal development. This is lifestyle change. It's what we're all, it's the only reason that anybody would listen to a podcast other than an entertainment one. So everybody listening here, you want that. But I would say, what's going to, what's going to be the key here. It's not because from this, you're going to figure out, okay, what do I need to eat and what's best for me? And there, you know, there's a lot of detail after this too. But the bigger thing I would say is what is your goal? What is your motive? And if it's not big enough, don't, don't, don't make yourself feel guilty or because you're not going to do it. Uh, what is that avatar out there? Do you want to, you know, look good for your next reunion, uh, which is kind of a short standing thing. Do you want to look good for your spouse? Do you want to look good for yourself? Do you just want to have more energy to do your work? Well, to write a book, do you want enough energy to take care of your kids because you're about to strangle them and just ditch it all? I mean, we're seeing depression and, and things on such a big rise as well. Do you want to be 90 and not be lingering in the nursing home? And is that a big enough motive? I think for most people, it's not, I don't know why it is for, well, avatar every, for us. Every, everybody is going to say, no, I don't want to be done. That, that, well, that's a very, <clears throat> but what's that big, strong driving motive? The, the, the problem with the nursing home is that's 10, 20, 30 years away. Yeah. Tomorrow that's is tomorrow. Right tomorrow is tomorrow. That's and right. if we, on one hand, we say, well, even if you don't have your fruit loops and you eat some more broccoli and you, you run a box in a mailbox, people know that, but they, they get stuck because you don't feel super awesome after one day of that. Yeah. We're back to that. No, you feel irritated because now it's, you've had a hard enough day. Can't I just eat something that tastes good and doesn't that's take right. much time? Now we're back into the, the, the stress and the struggle of life and I still need to have convenience and fast and I got to get things done. So how do we be becoming the kind of people we want to become not only at 91, but also at 51. Um, and, and that's goes to your motivation. Yeah. And this is why you hear the people who are shouting from the rooftops when they have made a lifestyle change and gotten a result, you know, and this is a year down the road or whatever, because they realize, holy smokes. That was such hard work. They're so proud of themselves for having done it. They're so thrilled at the payoff that now they want to tell everybody and everybody's seen that probably positively and negatively uh, from folks. But yeah, it, it is. So if anybody has achieved, if you went to school and got a degree and got the dream job, if you courted somebody and they said, I do, and it's this big event, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about here's a norm that you're saying, I'm going to jump out of to achieve something. It is hard. Um, it is, it is monumental. It, and I'm going to balance you out okay. and by saying, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I want to uh, caveat that by, by saying, uh, food in general will never become monumental. People can achieve a weight loss. They can achieve a goal like that. But most of us, and in fact, when people, I find that I have to remind patients of the things that have gotten better over, let's say a year yeah, because they yeah, forget that's, that's it, it just, the headache ebbs away and they're like, Oh yeah, son of a gun. I, I, I totally had, forgot that I haven't. The they, migraine I had every other day I haven't had in six months. Wow. But that they don't wake up and say, Oh, no migraines. How awesome. They just go about their day yeah. with the next challenge. True. Okay. And yeah. so, so that's where I, I would steer people away from the hope of the, the marriage kind of monumental thing when we talk about our input output recovery, rarely is there going to be these gigantic milestones. It's the day in and day out consistency, it's the true. hard choices every day to be becoming the kind of person who has a headache less often. Yeah. But for most people, they don't realize that they have a headache less often. 
because now they're dealing with the next challenge like they should be. People yeah. like you didn't walk in today and say, hey, Randy, I am not depressed. <laughs> I am, I, and I, <laughs> or my knee doesn't hurt. It, it, yeah. You know, you don't think about those things. Uh, you and know what, it's, it's, just, it's so funny you say that because I've always had kind of creaky knees. And I think at some point you said, well, maybe, you know, something you're eating or whatever. And they don't so much now, but I don't think about it. It was, I was bending down the other day and go, huh, I was quiet. I just, yeah, I didn't. And, and to some extent I could hear somebody say, who cares? Well, you know, I don't, and, but it's the fear that if I let that go on, am I going to be the guy that is 65, 70, 80, and now I don't ski, I don't hike, I can't bend down to play with the kids. Yeah. That, that's so huge. I, I would agree. Who cares about creaky knees? But the problem is that creaky knees are the first step that leads to painful yeah. needs that leads to, yeah, I can't get down with kids. I can't go skiing. And it's, it's like your advanced diagnostics. So, you know, you, you, so, so with every patient, Randy does these, you know, this huge blood panel. I mean, if you take the normal blood panel with a normal doc, this is 10 times bigger. I, I don't know. It's huge. And it's going to look at these huge outlying things. And when he goes through it, nobody comes out scot-free and say, here's this, here's this, this. And you may say that, you know, gosh, well, who cares? True. But if this isn't corrected and this is where you blow people away, th this is generally where it's going to lead. And looking at these other factors with you, this is why you're having this issue now. And, and this one over here though, I mean, I know you did that with me. There was one of, gosh, that's kind of an outlier. And if that keeps going, I don't even know what it was. That's probably going to manifest somewhere. That scared me. I do not want that manifestation. And so right. what even do though I do, you don't have the manifestation now, even though, yeah. And it's, it's like supplements we talk about. I've been taking the you know, right supplements for six months. I don't feel anything, but you're looking at the labs going, yeah, well, this got better and this got better. And so the chances of you having the manifestation of whatever over here, like which is, which is normal mm -hmm. it is going to be less. I do want that. So if again, go to, go to head today to whatever I'm putting in my mouth or not, whatever is, is judging how I'm going to perform the rest of the day, physically, mentally, the, the next week, the next month, the next year, every day I'm building up the propensity for, again, you be, to be becoming That's sick right. and ill, handicapped or, or not again, a lesser or, or, chance. Guys, uh, we should yeah. say there. So we always do. So here, here we are, Randy and Kevin eating, you know, as perfect as we can and exercise and all these things that we're going to be talking about as we continue on the show. And yet tomorrow we could get a cancer diagnosis. It's possible, less probable, less probable. And that's what we're going on. Less probable. That's right. Everything has to be couched in the terms of risk, right? There is no right. guarantee, but right. you are making a bad outcome less likely and a good outcome more likely. I had somebody say like, like your thing of everybody's you know, going to die of something that all this effort to, to, be well that I could have the next mountain bike accident or a car accident get sure. and, and it's gone. I'm sure. a paraplegic and all that effort granted. granted. Am I going to live on that? Uh, I'm going to not expect that and go forward increasing my probability, less risk of being well, having longevity, not lingering. And uh, you know, again, right now, everybody listening, the chances are if you don't have any symptom of anything, praise God. Um, chances are somebody has something. There's a little bit of something working there, a little bit of something you'd like. Maybe it's, you know, you'd like less weight. Um, you'd like. Well, and, and I would always kind of teasingly say, I'll find something wrong with you, right? That <laughs> whatever you think of as, as normal isn't normal, that nobody is perfectly well. Mm -hmm. Nobody is perfectly healthy. There's always something that is a tipping towards not as well as it could be. Or on the flip side, even if you say I can run an eight minute mile, well, maybe you should run a seven minute mile. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's. Or can you run that eight mile, eight minute mile five years from now? Five years Why from now. Why not? We don't expect or, to. Or recover faster. You know, the, the, yeah, the, the expectation also is that, again, that's that it's gotten to be normal and it shouldn't be. Why should I, at the age of 48, expect that my performance is so drastically less than it was at 28? We expect that. I still, sometimes those thoughts will go in my mind. I don't feel older. I don't feel any less able, but I feel like I'm supposed to think that I can't perform as well. And yet if I'm doing the right things, how, how long should I be able to keep it up? I mean, obviously there's going to be some decline. Like you say, we're all going to die. Right. And everybody who is 48 is not 28. And, and I, I would, but then we could look back and say, well, maybe at 28, you weren't as well trained as you could have been. And you're actually outperforming that at, at 48. 28 i didn't know how to eat i was a pro cyclist eating yeah. poorly and having volatile results and i didn't have the knowledge 
to know I'm feeding my performance. I'm eating better now, feeding my performance, not as a pro athlete, as a pro person, right. uh, as a pro husband, pro father, pro businessman, right. pro employer, whatever. And uh, yeah, I wish and to that extent, I feel like I, sh I should be performing. Well, remember, you're still a pro wannabe. Yes. But from a professional standpoint. I am always. <laughs> it is, you are feeding yourself the kind of fuel that you need to be becoming the kind of person that you want to be not perfectly. And you're increasing the chances. And, and now, you know, we almost have to kind of quit talking because at, at some yeah. point you can't come to the perfect conclusion. There's always tension. There's always the what about, well, there's an understanding. Hopefully we have helped with, like you said, awareness and understanding. And now it's up to everybody to make their choice. Uh, they're going to get up tomorrow and really to look for that. When we're talking, there was a, a book written a long time ago. It was called, I think it was called Diet for Life, wasn't that? The, the Diamonds, I think. It's an old, old book, but the, their premise somewhat was stop having a diet for a certain period of time. We all need to adopt a diet for life, which everybody has right now. So everybody who's listening, us included, we have a diet we have adopted, agreed to, decided upon to some extent, uh, even if we didn't consciously choose, we, but we've done right. it. And everybody every day, eats. the week goes by and we generally have eaten the same things this, uh, you know, most days, most weeks, most months, we have chosen on a diet. What diet do you want to, what's your goal? And then what diet do you want to adopt that gives you the best chance for achieving that goal? And there's where we're all left and deciding, do I take the bite of that? Do I take, yeah. Do I so eat at, at the end of our discussion, it's still a, a huge question. And, and, and you and I have, have battled about that. It's like, well, we've talked about a lot of theory, mm -hmm. the cultural drift and those kind of things. And, and somebody can still throw their hands up frustrated and say, oh, well, okay, but what do I eat for breakfast? If it's not Fruit Loops or Cheerios or whatever, then what is for breakfast? And, right. and I always am, it, it's tough to say, okay, well, here's your diet. And there's, there's already dozens of books, dozens of styles. Today, we want to really have people begin the process of increasing their awareness, their understanding. Why would you make a change? To what end? To what goal? Um, there, and, and, you know, what is the right diet? And the answer is always going to be, it depends. You know, I, I think, know. I think people, politics is in such the forefront these days that people are pretty good at questioning most of what they see in the headlines on politics, on this decision, on this person's opinion. They don't have any problem questioning it, like being arrogant enough to question, you know, they're arrogant enough, be arrogant enough to question the norm of the American diet. Uh, or any culture that you're in. Again, I keep talking about America. We live here, but if somebody's listening to this in, in Italy, there's probably some things that they may be doing culturally that are, are, are better than what we do here, but we got people dying from stuff over there. And, they're, and I, I would say be humble enough to admit that your own diet isn't maybe the right one. Yes. <laughs> sure. Be, I, I would, so anybody that proposes, you know, the keto diet, the paleo diet, the plant paradox diet, the whatever diet, I, I, I have some, I'm, I'm skeptical. Yeah. And those people want to generally say, Hey, this is the great diet for most people. But if I'm thinking of myself, I want to be humble enough to say, maybe I should consider that. Yeah. And, and that's, again, we're in the tension of be skeptical, but also be humble of your own personal, whatever you're doing and recognize that you're not perfect. And how could you improve yourself and those kind of things. And then every day you're going to pick a pathway. Yep. So if you're listening to this, you can go to, the aware broadcasting Facebook page and put a question in there. If you got a question on it, feel free, go there and ask a question and uh, uh, be as specific as you want. We'll do our best. Uh, but uh, I wish we could give all the prescriptive decisive offerings to you here on what is best for you, but it's a personal journey and we'll continue talking about it here on the show. That's why you're here. There you go. See you next show.